We are living in a unique moment in history. Transformational changes are happening across sectors faster than ever before. The pace of change is starting to exceed our ability of traditional organizations to adapt. They're still designed like centrally planned economies, where one entity decides where does talent go, where do jobs go, where do resources go. And we know central planning doesn't work. It's not able to keep up with this fast pace of competition that we are dealing with. As Jack Welch said, if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. So I took 367 companies that have appeared on most innovative lists of the last five years, and I said, how many of these outperform their competition? And what I found is only 13 companies outperform. So there are really only 13 companies that we can say actually are innovative. So I'm not saying it's just good to be good. What I'm saying is that today you no longer get to choose. If you just want to maximize shareholder value, the smart thing to do is to engineer a strategy that is good for the world. What we're trying to do is inconsistent with what's been done before. And the question is, are you going to play this game like a thinker or an outthinker? My favorite phrasing of what they're looking for is that of Gandhi. He said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. This is one strategic concept. It's been around for millennia. We've just changed what we call it. And today, I invite you to call it the fourth option. The reason I call it a fourth option is because it represents the point at which others stop thinking. This idea of a fourth option is the source of all competitive advantage in all domains. If we look at the companies that do outperform their competition, what we see is five things that they do right. First, they avoid the distraction of innovation theater. Second, they don't limit themselves to innovating just in the product. Third, they don't overlook their scale, they embrace their scale. They don't isolate innovation is number four, and they cultivate the garden. They focus on employee-driven innovation. And what I found is that over 70% of society's most transformative innovations came from employees, not entrepreneurs. We're moving from complex plans to simple statements of purpose. Ideas are not gonna come from boardrooms, but they're gonna come from hallways. We're gonna see companies abandoning one business model and embrace having an ecosystem of business models. We're gonna stop moving from asking people to write business plans to allowing them to make experiments, take action on their ideas in order to prove them. We're gonna move from hierarchies to small, agile teams. And companies are gonna evolve from centrally planned economies to platforms where people are free to find opportunities, select them, rally the resources to pursue them and impact the world. The rules are changing for us, and the question is, are you gonna start learning how to play the new game, or are you gonna keep playing the game the way you have been playing? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, I really appreciate it, thank you. Let me give you an example of a fourth option. Just to take us out of today, we're gonna to talk about business and innovation and the future, but let's go back in time. Let's go back to 240 BC in China. One general was given a critical job. The emperor gave him 50,000 men and told him to march across the kingdom, cross a river, get to the other side, and quell the rebellion. Now, when he got to his side of the river, he saw 100,000 rebels had appeared on the other side to stop him from crossing. So he said, what are my options? And he decided he had three options. One option is to go back to the emperor and explain to him, sorry, I couldn't across the river because there were people waiting for me on the other side. So he thinks, hopefully that's the suboptimal option. What's the next option? What if I wait until the rebels leave? But then it occurs to him, they're never gonna leave because they've achieved their mission just by being there. So he's about to conclude, if I can't go back and I can't wait, well then I must go forward, right? There's reverse, there's neutral, there's forward, and he's gonna order his men to wade through the water and attack the enemy waiting for us on the other side. How many people are excited about this option? Right, probably we're all gonna die. We're outnumbered, we're fighting uphill, we, we're on the offensive, they're on the defensive, they see us coming. So here's what he did. 
he ordered his men to take sandbags and they built a dam upriver. And when the water receded, he ordered them to cross. He gets to the other side and he's engaged with the enemy and he orders his men without giving them forewarning to turn around and run back to his side of the river. And what do the rebels do? They follow him. Exactly. He waits for half the rebels to get to his side of the river. Half of them are still wading through the water. And what does he do next? He lifts up the dam. Exactly. He washes away half the rebels and then he turns around to fight. Now let's look at our strategic situation. We're no longer outnumbered. We're evenly matched one to one. We're no longer fighting uphill. We're fighting downhill. We're no longer on the offensive. We're on the defensive. And now the water creates a disadvantage for them because they're backed up against the river. We turned a situation that we couldn't win into one that we can't lose. And we did that just by stopping and asking, what is the fourth option? Now, I propose that we see fourth options every day, but we keep jumping into the river. you're going to need to do is you're going to have to look for fourth options in lots of areas of your business until you find the magic combination. Here's a good example of a company that found the magic combination. Uh, Urban Outfitters is a retailer founded in Philadelphia where I'm from. They have grown uh, remarkably quickly, same pattern. They struggle for years to find their magic formula from 1970 to about 2002, 2003, and then they get it right and poof, they start exploding. Now they consistently grow faster and they are more profitable than their competition. Here's the five-year average revenue growth rate for Urban Outfitters versus their closest competitor in terms of revenue, American Eagle Outfitters than their peer average, closest 10 competitors and similar revenues. And then look at their profit margins. See, it's, it's not hard to grow faster than your competition. All you have to do is shrink your margins, right? Charge lower prices, over-invest in sales and marketing, over-invest in service, but that's not what Urban Outfitters does. So we got a chance to interview the founder of, of Urban Outfitters and asked him, how is it that you're able to unlock this level of profitable growth and your competitors are not able to copy it? And he said, well, it was really when we discovered five things, five fourth options. It took us a while to experiment and rethink how the industry operates, but there are five things that we discovered created the magic formula for us. The first is, they said, we decided that we only serve one customer, college students. And if the Gap wanted to copy it, copy this element of our strategy, we realized they couldn't. They'd have to say, we don't care about your pregnant wife. So we're not going to sell maternity wear. We don't care about your kids. So we're not going to sell children's wear. We're not going to sell you a tie. Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down on whether you think it's likely that the gap would adopt this element of their strategy. Thumbs down. So I think great strategies often begin with having a very clear definition of who we serve and who we don't serve and really being focused on that. Second thing he said, well, we started selling used clothing. Now, most of what we sell is new, but if you want to buy a reconstituted concert t-shirt or a vintage pair of jeans at Urban Outfitters, you can do that. It's messy, it's complex. If the Gap wanted to copy this element of our strategy, they'd have to send some buyers to India, source some jeans, ship them back to California, take them out of the container, they'd have to wash them and dry them and iron them and skew them and fold them and sort them and send them out to the stores. Now tell me, what is the probability that the gap will adopt this element of Urban Outfitters strategy. Thumbs down, this is enormously inefficient. And actually Urban Outfitters is inefficient. But since they're inefficient and everyone else is trying to be efficient, they're different. And since they're different, they can charge higher prices so they're more profitable. Third thing he said is, we realized we were recruiting uh, in the wrong way. We were recruiting from business schools. We need to start recruiting artists. We need to recruit from design schools and art schools. And once we have artists running our stores, we can give them more freedom. If you were a, uh, a manager of Urban Outfitters, if you are a manager of Urban Outfitters, and you go to work and you see someone's thrown out an old rusty lamp, and you think, wow, that would look pretty cool in the men's section of the store, you could actually take that and put it on display in the men's section. What do you think happens to the gap manager that shows up with a rusty lamp? Why does that matter? Well, now every Urban Outfitters looks a little different. 
the urban outfit is in one part of town, looks and feels a little different than the urban outfit in the other part of town. And how, people care, how many people here care about that? So you would choose a store to shop for clothing because you know that this store will look different than the other stores. How many people is that important to? And how many people are in college? See, Urban Outfitters doesn't care about us. They know that that's not important to us, but they know it's important to their core customer. If you ask college students what they care about towards the top of their attribute list is something like, this is real, this is authentic, this is, this is my Urban Outfitters. And I can get that at Urban Outfitters, not at The Gap. Now, this strategy is not a secret. Anyone can copy it. All The Gap would have to do is abandon 80% of their market, disrupt their supply chain, fire all their managers and hire new managers, and they can copy the Urban Outfitter strategy. The cost of doing that's higher than the cost of not doing that. And that's why they don't do it. Think of it again as the Legos. You come up with a set of interesting fourth options, you start stacking them on top of each other, and you build something that looks different. If you play the way you've always played, we know what the outcome will be. To change the outcome, I want you to change the way you play the game. Dick Fosbury, 1968, he goes over the high bar backward. So the little mini version of it, 1968 is University of Oregon student, sophomore. He goes to Mexico for the Olympics and he goes over backwards. Everyone laughs at him for doing this. He wins the Olympics, but eight years later, 90% of high jumpers are going over backward doing what's called the Fosbury flop now. There are two things I want to point out about this picture. The first is there's no new technology that suddenly made it possible to go over backward in 1968. Everyone before him had gone over forward though. So what is it that was missing? I propose what was missing is not what technology makes possible, but the concepts around that technology. And it's not to that concept is introduced and named something, Fosbury Flop. Can you find a coach who will train you on or talk about the best practices or go to a conference about it? Right? We can think about Salesforce introduced what became known as cloud in 1995, but it didn't really get into our minds and start changing behavior until it was named something that was sticky. And the second thing I want to point out is what makes these concepts disruptive is that they prevent others from adapting to the, the concept. And that's because they're inconsistent with prevailing logic and belief, prevailing dogma. You think about it, before 1968, every gold medal winner had gone over forward. Every trainer of every Olympic athlete had trained them to go over forward. Massive agreement that the way you go over is forward. And he literally turned his back on it. So this is what we're looking for, is to do something that's inconsistent with what people expect. So these are broad macro shifts in how strategy is done. These are the Fosbury Fops emerging. These are the three pointers emerging. There's one more that you want to think about. Create something out of nothing. See, we follow the game of business often following a rule that doesn't exist. And the rule is we have to play with the pieces on the board. It's like chess, you can't take a queen out of your back pocket and put it next to my king. But there are other types of games. In many countries in Asia, the analog to chess is Go, and in Go, the rules are the opposite. In Go, you cannot move the pieces. You can only add pieces and remove pieces. So what if we played the game of growing our businesses Following this rule, what if we can only add and remove things? What would you like to add? Well, one thing we can think of adding is a customer. If we define our market by people who are in the market. What if we added new people to the market? Tony Fernandez, he was an accountant in 2001. He quit his job. He bought an airline. It cost him 27 cents because the airline was bankrupt. But today, it's the second largest discount airline in the world. And his core concept was, we're not going to compete for airline customers. Instead, we are going to compete for non-airline customers, railroad customers. And we're going to engineer the whole business, our product, our marketing, how we distribute, how we price. Engineer all of that to get railroad customers to start taking the airline instead. 
You can find customers that your competitors don't consider customers and bring them into the market, they're much easier to compete with. Create a new category. Julie Copeland, she's one of our clients and a friend. She sells safety equipment, hazmat suits and gloves. And it's a really low margin business because you maybe negotiate with the CFO, but then you're selling to the purchasing manager and the purchasing manager just negotiates down to the lowest possible price. And she said, well, you know, we should not be selling safety equipment. We should create a new category. We're just going to sell safety. What would it look like to just sell safety? Well, we'll give you the safety equipment, but we'll also bundle in with that some OSHA compliance consulting, some safety training. We'll wrap, wrap it all up, and we're going to call it safety care. She introduces safety care, and within six months, it's 10% of her revenue. Now it's much more significant. But more importantly, it gives her a relationship that is stickier and increases her pricing power with her customers, a partnership. Create out of nothing. It's sort of like if everyone was selling apples, right, and you're in a marketplace and everyone's selling apples, if you mix those apples with dough and sugar and sell apple pie, people don't know how much you're charging for your apples. That's the principle. Same thing Gatorade did when it was selling salty water on football fields for years. Pepsi and Coke, they don't see them growing as they're growing and growing, but they, on their market share reports for Pepsi and Coke, there's no line item for sports drink. Same thing that Red Bull did with energy drinks. Tons of applications of this, but it really is worth sitting down with your team, spending 15 minutes, spending an hour and saying, what would we like to add to the game? What new customers or occasions or categories or needs? If we had a magic wand, what would we like to add to the game? The next narrative I'd like you to think about is to be good. Be good. So the old paradigm was that companies existed to serve one master, maximize shareholder value. And if you did that, everything would work out. But increasingly, companies are realizing that by focusing only on shareholders, we create resistance to our growth, and that diminishes shareholder value. A smarter strategy is one where you maximize shareholder value or owner value by benefiting all stakeholders. When your growth is good for the community, employees, clients, the government, the country, the environment, the world, well, that's the ultimate strategy. So here's what I'm saying. I'm not saying if you make money, it's a good idea to share it. No, I'm not saying. I'm saying if you only want to make money, the smart thing to do is have a strategy that benefits the world. My wife's the general counsel at MasterCard. And she's more engaged at work than she's been in the last 20 years, to a great extent because their CEO, Ajay Banga, has aligned them behind the idea that they're a force for good. At MasterCard, we believe those efforts begin with the belief that business can be a force for good in the world and that when the public and private sectors partner, we can be transformative, doing great things that make a meaningful difference. So what he brings to the vision internally is that we are pursuing a world beyond cash. From a financial perspective, a world beyond cash means that 90% of transactions, which are still cash in the world, are going to turn into electronic. We're going to capture our fair share of that. And we're going to make a lot of money. But he also says a world beyond cash is a better world because in a world beyond cash, a drug dealer is not going to sell drugs to your child and have that be untraceable. A world beyond cash creates transparency, accountability. It is a better world. That helps with regulators. It helps with customers. It engages employees, especially younger employees, powerfully. It creates soft power. It creates moral force. And you see most large companies starting, and it's been underway for 10 years, really, this, this movement, but most large companies are starting to kind of adopt this view. This is Jamie Dimon, and uh, he said major employers are investing in their workers and communities because they know it is the only way to be successful over the long term. And this is part of the business roundtable, which I don't know if you read a couple months ago. They have 150 CEOs from GM and other large companies, and they came together and said, what is the purpose of a corporation? Well, it used to be the purpose of a corporation was shareholders first, but now it needs to be community employees and then shareholders. Just to make it practical for you as well, here's something you could do. My wife, I mean, my, my cousin from Germany, she moved to 
Brooklyn to work for this company called Holstein. She was just inspired by their manifesto. Uh, a few years ago before she joined, she, they, they issued this manifesto. I'll just read the first third of it to you. This is your life. Do what you love and do it often. If you don't like something, change it. If you don't like your job, quit. If you don't have enough time, stop watching TV. If you're looking for the love of your life, stop. She'll be waiting for you. He'll be waiting for you when you start doing things you love. This says nothing about the efficacy of their products, but it transformed their business. More customers wanted to buy from them. Suppliers wanted to supply them. Distributors wanted to distribute for them. It creates soft power. It creates moral force. So if you sit down maybe with your team and say, how can we tap the strategic power of doing good? Here's some sub-questions to explore. How can we profitably solve a problem in the world? How can we better and more authentically communicate the good that our work does in the world? What can we start doing and what can we stop doing to do better in the world? And you brainstorm some ideas, you're going to find some potential fourth options. There.